So I'm just over on the YouTube watch page. As soon as it comes through, I will um, mute the watch page and we'll get started. No we problem. Have... Seven people. Uh, yeah. Mute the watch page and we'll get started. Right, sweet. There it is. Yeah, there we go. Perfect. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Let's see who's here. Tracy Bryant in my hometown of Los Angeles and Tracy Smith. Um, Tracy Smith is a ed tech expert. She's amazing. Irvine. Hi, Maggie. Um, that's about an hour from me. So anyway, this is episode 17 of the Take Note Chat. I've been on hiatus for a little while, and so I'm super excited to be back. And um, live streaming during a pandemic, I probably have packages showing up at my door any minute. And so my dogs might go ballistic. We'll see. I might have to mute myself and run away real quick. But um, anyway, in this episode, my guest is Brandon Bodendorfer. He's a person who runs several businesses, and they all had to switch to working remotely when COVID-19 put much of the U.S. in a stay-at-home order. Um, today, Brandon's going to show us how he and his employees use OneNote shared notebooks to improve their ability to work together. We'll be taking questions and comments throughout this live video in the YouTube chat box. And if you're catching on replay, just drop a comment and um, we, we can be responding to your comments there. You can also post or uh, share about this event using the hashtag take note chat. Before I introduce Brandon, I wanted to ask if anyone watching live uses shared notebooks for a work purpose or a personal purpose. And if so, put a comment in the chat box and tell us how you use shared notebooks. So now let me tell you about today's guest. Um, Brandon is the founder of the Keys to Success Planning System and a big fan of OneNote. He also operates multiple businesses and mentors other businesses in growth and SEO. And he has a YouTube channel that's linked below in the description. So uh, welcome, Brandon. How's it going today? Uh, I'm doing great. How are you? I am doing absolutely fabulous. It is, I live in Wisconsin, and it is a uh, is a rising 81 degrees. So I have uh, definitely, uh, being in Wisconsin, we are generally uh, okay with winter being negative 40. But when it gets to be uh, in the 80s, it gets to be a little bit of a challenge for many of us. Wow. But because uh, because 80 isn't that hot, you know, like there's a lot of the country that gets, you know, into the 90s, well above 100. So, eight, you know, wow. It's a human. It's a human 80 degrees, though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, meeting with you guys and talking to you guys all today a little bit about, you know, basically working remotely. This pandemic has been something that a lot of us have really just kind of had to change our entire lifestyle and you know, work remotely with, uh, and still be able to accomplish our main goals. If it be work, uh, virtual learning, uh, I've seen a lot of a lot of people use shared notebooks for virtual learning between teachers and between uh, students, and just you know, even parents. You know, we know, we kind of sometimes forget that there's a lot of uh, families out there that uh, are split, uh, but yet during this time, I've talked to a lot of parents that between uh, the mom and the dad, they've used shared notebooks to kind of help with some of those homework assignments and different things. As here we are in June, uh, there's still a lot of uh, uncertainty what's gonna happen in the next school season. So uh, this is a good time to really talk about shared notebooks uh, and just how you can really use them to be more effective and collaborate across uh, work, pleasure or play. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Right as you were talking, we've gotten three comments. So Tracy Smith, she's our ed tech expert. She uses them for work. We have a OneNote staff notebook through the through our team's channel that the ed tech team that she works with uses. And um, she shares one with the campuses she supports. Maggie says, my husband and I started sharing a family notebook with his family very recently. Um, and uh, um, there was one other one. Okay, let me scroll back up and get that last comment. Um, Another Tracy says, my sister lives in Florida. I live in California. We use shared notebooks to assist our mother who lives in Virginia. So all really interesting. So we have like a family notebook, a notebook for a family living apart, and then, you know, a educational notebook. 
Absolutely. Yeah. And that's the beautiful thing about OneNote is, you know, having the different notebooks, you can really, even in the same application, really address uh, your work, life, and even additional notebooks with, you know, in this case, if you're doing something with your husband, if it be sharing that family calendar or schedule, uh, have multiple notebooks it can really help kind of break that up and divide it and really help even with your life work balance by having those different notebook assignments. One thing that we do in our organization, we'll share this with you guys, is we actually by team, we create a notebook. So our creative team uh, has a notebook they share. We have a, a, a notebook that's just designed for customer interaction. Uh, we have a projects notebook uh, for active projects that are currently taking place. So I'll be able to show some of those to you guys as we move through the broadcast and give you I, I different ideas. But I always tell people when it comes to working remotely, a lot of times the most important, but yet sometimes the biggest frustration is just being able to communicate and being able to get to a level where that your communication is very precise because even through like zoom calls and facetiming and different collaboration softwares there's still a communication barrier uh, so if we have one notebook that's jam-packed with tons of different resources uh, and your team that you're working with in that call or in that organization is really has a macro focus it's good to kind of break up those notebooks so we'll show you some of that here as we move through it uh, yeah, I think that's all like really good advice and interesting as well. Um, so let me just check the chat here. Okay, so um, we're going to uh, get into the content. And before we do that, I want to talk about just kind of the overall structure of OneNote, just to make sure we're kind of on the same page. So within OneNote, you have your account, and then you can have multiple notebooks. And I like to think of OneNote notebooks as like a three ring binder, because within that binder, you can have um, tabs, which are sections, and then pages. And there's a couple of other levels of organization just for completeness, but that's kind of the general structure. So you have an account, multiple notebooks, and that'll be important to know as we go forward, because you're gonna talk about how you use the different shared notebooks. So the first thing uh, we wanna jump into is Brandon, what's a shared notebook? Well, the simplest thing with a shared notebook is a shared notebook is really just any notebook that you have. And for a lot of people, uh, you need to share it to some level on your uh, cloud account. So if you have OneDrive, you would share that notebook or have that notebook shared and posted on your cloud drive. And then simply in your host file, if you're the host, share that, invite other people to have access to it and individuals will be able to have access to it where they can make edits, as well as just simply being able to view the content. And what I find uh, in a lot of cases, a good example would be is I know a business that has a notebook that is their conference room scheduling. And during COVID-19, they're not really uh, probably using those conference rooms like they used to, but what they had is they had a few editors that had the ability to edit that notebook and be able to make assignments and scheduling to those conference rooms. But then quite honestly, what they could do is they had a whole bunch of other people that had only view access. So they could only see who was using those uh, conference rooms and not be able to make edits. But yet if they needed to request a conference room, they could easily go through those channels and do so. Okay, so that makes sense. And it's a good demonstration of the idea that only the people in charge of the scheduling have edit privileges, but other people can view it to see when it's available. So that's an important difference is that people can have edit or view privileges. Um, and I just want to mention that um, Dawn is here from Wisconsin and she's using your uh, journal, Brandon. Very cool. That's, that's always cool, cool to see. You. Yeah. Um, okay. And just to be clear, shared notebooks are different than classroom notebooks, right? Uh, yes, um, there is elements in the notebook just the same, but a shared notebook is really something that you can do personally uh, with a personal account. Mm -hmm. And I think shared notebooks are, you know, you can have an editor and then viewers, or you can have it just be peer to peer where everyone has the same access where the, the classroom notebook, I think, is specifically designed for it to be teacher and students. I believe that is correct. I've not been a big user of classroom notebooks, yeah. um, but uh, one thing I guess that's important to know is that don't feel you have to have a classroom notebook to be able to do this. Anybody that has a personal uh, OneNote account will be able to do some type of shared 
notebook. And I know people have asked about, well, do I need to have SharePoint or do I need to have a work account? You don't necessarily need to do that. Uh, you can simply do it with a personal account. Uh, are we able to show my screen yet? Because I could easily yes. show someone how they can go about doing that. Sure. Um, let me just see. Let me just check our notes here. OK, so we're going to go into that and then we'll talk about um, kind of getting into your specifics. So I'm going to add your screen and there we go. Um, so just to kind of give you guys the basics here, you can see up in the top right corner and you can do this from uh, a laptop. You can even do it from the iPad. You can also do it if you log into OneNote.com. But right up here, you can go ahead and you can hit share. And at this point, you have a couple options. You can go ahead and invite people to the notebook. You can copy a link and send it to them or you can just send a copy of the page. To share it though with them, you need to go ahead and click invite people to this notebook. Now they will need to have an account that is linked to OneNote. So if they already have an account established, great. If they don't, it's always a good time to connect with them and you can always share that link with them. But you just simply go ahead and you write out their email address. If you wanna include a message, you can. And then this gives them the option right here. Uh, you can toggle this on and off, but this allows them to edit or just simply view. And one important part about this is how do you manage this? Uh, in different applications, you can manage it different ways, but if you are in your version of OneNote online, and I usually do this through OneNote.com because it had, gives you probably the best uh, access, is through here, once you log in, and I'll log in here in a second, you guys will be able to see that you can actually easily manage uh, who has access to this account uh, just as easy. And that way, if maybe you had an employee uh, or a work colleague uh, that maybe necessarily didn't need to have access to it, you could easily grant them access and then remove their access. You can also even go to the point and you can even go to the point of even allowing people to, people to have access for a certain amount of days uh, or time if you would share a link with them. Oh, that's pretty cool. So you can say, you know, this, th th there's a time limit, like you might need a collaborator on your notebook just for a certain amount of time. I didn't know that, that you could put a time limit on it. That's really cool. Yeah. So like you see now, uh, we're back uh, on OneNote.com uh, and I logged in. You can see here's a share button here. Again, this gives you the option where you can go ahead, you can allow person to edit, you can set that expiration date. Uh, as well as you can even set a password. So that way, if you shared it with them, but you didn't want to necessarily, uh, maybe they have a community computer, uh, you could set up a password that they need to do. And then once you go ahead and do that, you can hit apply, and then you can go ahead and you can type in the individual's name. Now, if you already have people that you've shared with, in some cases, they'll show up in your library uh, of people that you've already communicated with. And again, you can type a message. Why is a message important to type? Uh, I always think it's important to type because a lot of times what'll happen is this isn't an email that's coming from you, it's coming from Microsoft. So sometimes people won't necessarily understand why they're getting it, especially if you told them, hey, I'm sending you this shared notebook. Quite frankly, they're expecting probably an email from you. This is actually to come from Microsoft. So it's always good to go ahead and put, hey, Sally, I'm sending, here's a notebook I told you I'm gonna send. It's related to this or that. Uh, and it's a good way to, to be able to communicate that with. Once you have somebody that has already had access to your notebook, uh, if we back up here, uh, we're able to manage uh, those files um, and be able to allow people to not have access to it. And I guess I'm gonna jump into here and you'll see my notebook. From here, I can go ahead and I can click on uh, one of the notebooks and I'll be able to go in and basically determine who has access uh, and remove them if I, I need to. You can also, um, actually I'm in the wrong screen. Uh, it's in that root screen that we were in. I gotta go back into OneNote, but you can go ahead and from there, you can uh, manage who has access and who doesn't. Um, and I have uh, two comments to add. Tracy Smith says that uh, all Office online apps now allow that. I'm assuming she means like sharing and the various options for sharing, and that's awesome. And then she also seconded your idea of typing a message because otherwise people will delete it thinking it's spam. Yeah, and, and a lot of times I, I will tell you this, it does sometimes come up in the spam box. Uh, if when the message comes through, someone tells you that they didn't get it, I always tell them, hey, check your spam folder. It's likely that it's possibly in there. Okay, good. Uh, and what are we looking at right now, just real quick? 
Like I think uh, people are be really interested in what that you're showing on the screen right now. So what this is here, this is actually our customer folder. So what we have, as I was telling you about having different levels and different notebooks based on uh, different groups in our in our business. In this case here, this is our customer folder. And we have literally every customer that we work with is in this notebook. And I can pull up information about those customers and see all the different notes uh, that we may have written. And one question that you know, she made up one gal made a mention to is about sharing different pages. One big power that I feel is really important to OneNote is that you can embed PDF files, you can embed images in there. So it's a really good place to collaborate. And then on top of that, you can add obviously text documents or different images, different handwritten notes into uh, those notebooks as well to help communicate as you're going through it. And also on like the desktop version, uh, you'll even be able to see who can ma who's made edits and changes to the notebook uh, as well as revisions. So like if you're using like a Surface, you can even go through some of the pages and you'll be able to see different re uh, revisions uh, that are being made to the notebook as well. Mm -hmm. um, and this page we're looking at here, this is from your Keys to Success Planner, is that correct? Uh, yeah, this is our, um, our CRM. Uh, okay. We created a CRM toolkit to really kind of help people understand and uh, be able to connect with their customers or in the relationships that they have. So many CRM managers that, that are out there are so digital focused and are so um, embedded online like Salesforce and stuff. And I found that if I'm doing a lot of handwriting using a Surface or an iPad or something, a lot of times I find more success writing my notes. So I created a, a client board or a CRM toolkit that really kind of helps uh, process either if you're in marketing, customer service, or if you're in sales, this kind of gives you that space to kind of process your relationship with the customer and kind of work through uh, each and every step of the, either the sales process or just the customer retention. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just wanted to mention that because you do make the whole keys to success planner, which um, is specifically designed, at least the, the OneNote version of it is, is specifically designed to be used in OneNote. And people, uh, I find, love these attractive, really graphic, kind of like nice looking pages that look like a notebook. And that was why I wanted to just point that out, that that's part of your planning system and the stuff that you sell, which is uh, linked in the description. So. Absolutely. Okay. So we don't have any questions at the moment. Um, let's get into what did your uh, work site, like what did your work environment look like before COVID-19, just so people kind of have a context? Well, prior to COVID-19, I mean, we uh, have an office and there's about, I think there's 15 or 16 people that work in that office. And to kind of give you guys a little background on what it is that I do, uh, about 15 years ago, I started a print shop uh, with a couple buddies. And back then, printing was, we printed on letter presses and offset printing. So now we went to really, we're a strong digital company. So in 15 years, we really went through a lot of innovation uh, as you know, offset printing kind of navigated into digital printing and marketing from paper kind of really navigated into social media and website. And we've kind of really tried to innovate and stay with that as we have all along just to you know keep our business intact. But we had 16 people prior to COVID-19 that were working in the same facility. Uh, we still have a print shop. Uh, we print everything from apparel to uh, different paper goods to decals. And that element of the shop, those that staff and that production, they very much have to be there to make sure the widgets get out the door. But our design staff, our content cre creation staff, our web designers, those that are in our um, media business, they didn't have a need or necessity to be in the office doing the work. Um, and we wanted to try to give uh, as much space to all of our staff as possible. And if the event there was some type of outbreak or some type of infectious between our staff that we would have had limited amount of exposure between our staff. So we basically made a selection that if you were in production, you had the ability to stay, but those that were outside of the production really needed to kind of work remotely. And the biggest challenge with that is, is a lot of times, especially in the print business, we are so keen on this uh, first print uh, always proof. So when something comes off the printer, if you're running 10,000 uh, sheets of letterhead or 10,000 uh, business cards, you don't want to print all 10,000 and then realize you have an issue. So we always have this mentality that what you do is when that first one comes off the printing press, you take it to the designer, that saw it and they review it and they 
then give the go-ahead. And as we're thinking about how we're going to do that, because we don't want to lose, uh, we didn't want to lose traction of our quality control. I really looked at okay, what elements of things that we already have in our business can we kind of integrate to a higher level? So obviously, we utilize a lot of video conferencing, but um, all of our staff work especially uh, worked at different times because when you're working at home, those that are working at home, it's not as easy as you think it is. I mean, the distractions, you've got pets, you have kids, you have a spouse, uh, sniffing another, whatever the story is, you got the mailman knocking on your door. Uh, there's so many uh, different distractions that take place. So we want to be able to make sure that our staff was able to communicate, especially with ourselves and maintain our projects. So we started utilizing OneNote to a higher level. We'd always used, the, we'd always used OneNote to really kind of manage some of our um, customer relationships, we never really used it as a scheduling board. So we started to even get to the point where we started to have assignment boards that we created that each of our staff, as they checked in, uh, they were able to basically see what their assignments uh, were for those days, uh, what their projects were that they are working on and be able to see those in real time and be able to kind of like, kind of keep up with the pace so we really utilized it as uh, an assignment board for that matter. And, it, and actually it's gone over really well, you know, different things that we were working on as far as like sales process, uh, those things all got entered into the notebook. Uh, we created a spot, as you can see here, where we just had some general information on some of the resources of what our different programs were. Uh, so that way we kind of had a landing space for all of our customers uh, as well as our staff to kind of be able to look at what their assignments were and, and things that they were doing. And this, would be an, and this would be an, a great example of that. You can see, you know, here is our client. Here's what our to-dos are. Uh, here's whose the responsibility is. And then obviously we're first part of June. So you can start to see that some of this stuff is already getting checked off. But for a lot of things, you know, it's just a good indicator of all the things that we have to do. So I kind of think of this in at our shop on one wall. We have a giant four foot by eight foot whiteboard that represents uh, what needs to get done for the day and week. And we've pretty much taken that online with this. Wow. That's, that's really cool. And I'm totally like uh, nerding out on that. That's awesome. I love like just all that sort of the linear and the scheduling and stuff, how organized it is and that everyone kind of knows what they need to do and what the critical path is and all that. Um, I did want to mention one thing we had talked about before that you had said that prior to COVID, all of your employees were in like one building. So it was kind of easy to just walk back and forth and that that was something that changed when you had to switch to remote working. Yes, absolutely. That was probably the biggest change, especially for me because I'm not a big typer. Mm -hmm. I'm more of a visual guy. I'm pretty much, I'd rather call you on the phone or walk into your space and just have a discussion. And for a lot of, for a lot of the staff, I'm, I'm actually thinking that they're enjoying this remote working <laughs> uh, because I just can't walk in their office and barge in. Uh, mm -hmm. so there's, there's probably some pros to that, uh, from our efficiency standpoint now, but, um, this has actually helped me organize myself a lot better too, because it really gives me a space where I can see, uh, what's all taking place, uh, with all of our customers as well as myself. Um, yeah, that's, um, you know, I, that's really cool. And I think that that particular thing um, kind of replicating or compensating for the fact that you can't just walk from office to office is where you need to really be strong on your, um, you know, your digital game to, to, you know, when that's a really important part of your work culture and your workflow to be able to train, you know, go to working remotely, that's, you know, kind of the, the net that needs to be woven to, in order to successfully transition. Yeah. So for those that are kind of want to get started, if you're kind of in a leadership role, here's the first thing I would tell you. Um, look at the size of your team. Uh, you know, maybe you're only a one man band or, you know, five or six people in your shop and you guys have multiple roles, multiple hats. Even if you have multiple roles and multiple hats, I found it was very, uh, it was a lot more efficient to be able to have multiple notebooks uh, and kind of sort out the information in that notebook. And you can see here, like I told you, I, I was in the content business. So we have an, uh, a notebook that's just about articles that we're writing. So if we're in a process of publishing articles for our news publication, that's all done in here. Uh, all of our accounting is done in this notebook. Anything that we're doing with the customers is in a customer notebook. Is in a customer notebook. And, uh, and, the, and then anything that we're doing with projects is in this folder here. And what I found is by being able to kind of break some of these notebooks down, 
it allowed us then to assign different individuals that had access to the different notebooks. There were some people, you know, if you were in the print shop, I didn't necessarily want you to have access to edit the drafting or the creative process, but I wanted you to be able to see it. So that way, if you were by the printer and you had to pull off that business card and look at it, you could easily go into the customer tab and see that proof and say, yep, this is right. But I didn't want necessarily you have the ability to edit it. So by able being able to group different notebooks and assign different roles to different people that had access to them, it just made it a whole lot easier. Plus, I think the communication process was a lot simpler uh, because if you're working in one notebook, um, unfortunately, on an iPad, you can only have one uh, one notebook open at a time. Uh, you know, if you're lucky to be on a desktop or have a Surface, you can have multiple windows going simultaneously and be able to copy information from one from another. But it just made it a whole lot easier. So if you are starting this process now, I would encourage you to look at your business, try to look at it in terms of departments, uh, and then break out the departments by notebook. Uh, or categories of service and then assign people to it. And I think that'll at least give you some clarity about how the information in that notebook should be framed or should be distributed. There, um, you know, I think, um, I think all of that's really cool. Like that you're, you know, tailoring the notebook toward each person. And you had made a point when we were talking earlier that I just thought was so interesting. Like, I think if I was going into this as a new person, I would say, oh, well, we have the, the ability. Let's just let everybody see everything. That's super efficient. Then everyone can see what's going on in the company. And then, you know, you kind of said it as you were just explaining here, but you mentioned that it actually hindered people's efficiency because they were seeing all this stuff that had no relevance to them. So, um, yeah, I think that's a really good um, like kind of a tip and also like something to learn as you go. Like if you start just, you know, with everybody has access to everything and then you learn that it that's not the most efficient way to work. Yeah, and the other side of it too is that part of this COVID-19 um, remote working is sometimes you have to, no different than we're isolating, you have to isolate some of the communication because it can get, you can get confusing if you're getting a lot of different sound bites simultaneously. An example of that is, you know, if you're in a creative environment and you have a creative team, that creative team is basically spitting out a lot of different ideas. They're doing a lot of different drafts. They're doing a lot of different content that they're putting together. And if there's somebody that's really their job is to be the, the distributor or the publisher, they don't necessarily need to hear, I don't want to call it noise, but they don't need to hear that noise about what's happening in the creative element because honestly, it can overwhelm them and it can confuse them because maybe they heard about something like maybe if you're designing a new business card or a new postcard and you talked about having the dates for this event or this virtual class that you're going to do and you're going to do it on a Tuesday at 7 p.m. Well, maybe if they're sitting there and they see the print, and now it says Thursday at one o'clock in the afternoon. Well, you, they, they might question that because at the end of the day, even though the proof says it's good to go and the, and the information there is all right, they might question it because they heard conversation previously uh, about it being a different date. So I learned real quick is no different than we try to isolate ourselves to protect ourselves from the virus. When you're working remotely, you almost have to kind of isolate the communication and keep it in the right hubs so that as the communication moves forward and moves into the different areas and, and moves throughout the different people in your organization, it stays, it stays connected. It stays, um, it stays together in a sense that it's relatable to each individual as it passes on. And again, that's where the, the different categories and notebooks, I think, was really helpful in that for us. Uh, yeah, like I think that one tip alone is if people can nail that, that's just a huge thing because you know, like you were talking about with the person um, overhearing a conversation about the date. And if they have to go back and double check or verify, like you've just added a to-do item that wasn't necessary. Like had they been isolated from the communication properly in the first place, they wouldn't have that to-do item. So that's just, you know, and you can imagine multiplying that by, you know, every conversation or every little project and stuff. So that's, I think that one tip is just really good. Yeah, and I think Paul here just made a comment on the chat that I think hits home. If if they need to hear about it at work, it's good to share. But if they didn't need to have access at work, probably don't need to have global access remotely either. And this is, again, the different categories and notebooks can do that. The other side of it, too, 
is we're able to password restrict some things. So if I go into this notebook here, you'll see that I have a management uh, tab that has a password um, button on it. And that means if I wanna view that, I have to type in the password. Um, we have an actual password password keeper and you can see that I have to have a password to view that. The reason why we chose to do that uh, with shared notebooks and on certain pages and certain tabs is if you're working at home and you're using your computer and you get pulled away for a moment, it's not that I don't trust your family or the people moving in and out of your office. I just don't want the content on that page to get edited or get distributed the wrong way. So when you're gonna be inside this page, you need to enter that password to view that content. And then when you navigate off of it, uh, that content on that page is no longer available. And it's a good way to kind of like, it's not like the world's best security, but there's a level of comfort there uh, when it comes to being able to share some of this information across the board. Yeah, and you know, like I think it's not, yeah, like you said, it's not really an issue of trust. It's like someone's um, toddler could jump onto their computer or, or, you know, it could just be a mistake. And there's also like certain things inside of a business that just don't need to be public information. Like you have, you know, the invoicing and pay rates and, you know, things like that. And that just doesn't need to be shared with other people in a household that aren't part of the business, you know, so. Yeah, you know, and if any of you are watching or, or, or watch this later in time, you know, there's a lot of people in different departments that are trying to work through, especially marketing departments and people in the sales side of businesses during this whole COVID-19 have really kind of had a lot on their plate on what they communicate and how they go about communication. You know, what is their message? Uh, empathy has become such an important part of the sales process because of COVID-19 that I know there's a lot of individuals out there that were kind of struggling with what is their message that they're going to share as an organization. So in this case, you might want to restrict access to what you guys are thinking as an organization about what you're going to do with messaging until you're able to determine. And that's why having that content behind a password uh, or in a tab might be, you know, might be the best way. The other thing I've seen people do, especially those that are in businesses that every month have a different promotion, what they'll do is they will have a month, they'll password protect the month. Those that are in the creative department be able to add all the assets and resources into that. Maybe if it's call strips, the ads that they're going to publish, where they're going to publish, who their prospects are, they had to add that all on that June page, keep it password protected. But then what happens is on June 1st, to be ready to go, they on password protect that tab. And now everybody in the organization has access to that content. They can see what the new ads are, the new programs, who the call tree lists are, and it's all readily there for them. So if they have a conference call or a Zoom call, they can easily navigate for it. So sometimes the password protect isn't necessarily always about privacy. It could be just a place where you're starting to build a space out for content and then be able to use that down the road or open that up once all the content is ready to be delivered. Uh, yeah, that's another really cool tip because yeah, if you're if you're working on something that's going to happen in the future, you can imagine there's like a lot of drafts and a lot of pieces and a lot of like let's let's brainstorm some words to use here and that kind of thing. And you don't want people to see that before it's time. But also even for the employees, like you were talking about, you know, June first, we're gonna um un we're gonna reveal the new promotion and how that would even keep it like exciting and fresh for the employees. Absolutely, and we'll we'll even jump into another step. Uh, we're talking about collaboration. Uh, sometimes you want to have outside people have uh, access to this. So in one note, you know, you can easily go ahead and say, if I want to share this page, I can create a link to this page, as you guys can see here, copy link to this page, and that will save it to the clipboard. And then I can send them an email and then paste in that uh, link and they're able to view that page. We use that a lot with a, a lot of different communication that we are doing with clients. Maybe we want to share a page with them and make notations through a call. Uh, we were able to do that using features like that as well. Uh, and also, too, if you guys work in different time zones, uh, it's also a good feature to be able to share notebooks because, you know, what is three o'clock here is one o'clock somewhere else. And your day might go a little longer than mine, but I might start earlier than you. So, again, being able to have the notebook and being able to use that shared platform and check off boxes, if it be in projects, uh, it really allows the team to communicate. There's a lot of different um, websites that like monday.com that really in my mind are just there. It's really a version of what you can do in OneNote 
um, and you're paying for it. I, I think someone can take the time to utilize OneNote and really have a free experience and really have a really awesome remote whiteboard that people are able to access wherever they're at. Yeah, that's a really good point that, you know, a, you know, OneNote's free and it also is so um, flexible. Like you said, you can, you know, anyone that uses OneNote knows that you can do just all kinds of things within OneNote as opposed to having something that's just a project manager or just a job manager or something like that. So, uh, and it's, and it saves money. Who doesn't like to save money, you know? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm just looking at the uh, notes and you've talked about a lot of this, um, but is there anything that you can think of, like some of the things that you've learned during this experience? Um, is there anything that you've learned that you haven't already touched on? Honestly, the biggest thing that I learned through like COVID-19, and I, know that, I don't know if that really relates to working remotely, um, but it's really the spark of it, is I learned the value of the digital world. I mean, you know, I think prior to COVID-19, you know, we had the ability to be accessible in person, but because of COVID-19, we had to learn to work remotely to some level um, to practice safe social distancing. But I think what that really did is I think it opened up a lot of eyes uh, for a lot of people. It really opened up my eyes to the fact that, wait a minute, this is a world that we live in. And, you know, here Paul is in the UK. It's 930 at night. It's 330 here in central Wisconsin. It's uh, 130 out by you um, in California. So we're, we're all in a different time zone, but yet we're on this earth together and this COVID-19 has really taught me that we have a lot more in common than we have um, in separation. And by utilizing tools like OneNote and just understanding the power of communication, it doesn't matter what business you are in, you really have the ability to, if you have a product or service, network with a world of people. And that is probably one of the biggest things I've learned throughout this process was that we can't isolate ourselves to the people and organizations that are in our own communities. We have to learn to expand our connections and work outward and try to connect people abroad across states, territories, uh, regions, uh, countries for that matter. Because I think that's what's, as individuals, that's where a lot of our opportunities are. Yeah, that's really interesting. And it's just so it's so cool that Paul's here because here we are in these three different time zones and many others, I'm sure, um, all participating in the same conversation. And that's just, you know, like you said, it's powerful. Um, and yeah, that was, you know, I love what you just said. That's really cool about just doing more networking and more connection and communication and that kind of thing. And to sort of piggyback on top of that, um, Maggie has a question, which is, have you used OneNote for brainstorming? And this, I think, would be fascinating to hear about in terms of shared notebooks. Well, so I, she capitalized the word on. And yeah. so I was instantly thinking, okay, it's on some type of program. So I oh. went to Google quick and I uh, Googled uh, on brainstorming session. And it did bring back some key, uh, keywords. Uh, she'll have to expand on that for a little bit for me if that's actually a program or something. But yes, um, I think brainstorming is huge. And I think what's so cool about OneNote is I can remember uh, when I was a kid and I was in different youth programs, one of the biggest things that we did ah, on is OneNote. Okay, perfect. <laughs> right. I got I to gotta learn. You knew that, didn't you, Michelle, that ON was OneNote, didn't you? Um, <laughs> when I was a kid, though, I was in so many youth programs and we would put these giant post-it note, uh, post notes up on the board and we would like brainstorm, uh, brainstorm strategy. So like when I was developing my next uh, planner here for this next year, one of the biggest things that I really wanted in corporate is that brainstorming session. If like, And really to me, it's about visions. So I looked at uh, OneNote and I said, how can I use OneNote to really become a tool where I can really start to get my ideas and thoughts in place and I've really started to use OneNote over the last six months as means of brainstorming. And here's a prime example, uh, as this loads on the screen for you, is, you know, on my vision board for 2021, you know, I want to talk about my self goals, my career goals, my community goals, you know, what goals I have in a relationship. I haven't really defined those, as you can see here. But then being able to use OneNote to start to structure some of that content out. 
um, a lot of times when we're doing brainstorming, we don't understand how we want to basically put that in some, some type of chronological order. So to me, biggest part about OneNote that's so efficient is that you can draw, you can draw, you can put shapes, you can put clippets in there, uh, you can handwrite. Uh, and to, for me, uh, handwriting and clipping notes is such a way such a great way to stimulate the brain and the thinking process that if you got a tablet or something that has access to a pen, you can really do a lot of that. Now, you can do this same type of thing with a, a blank piece of paper. Uh, OneNote even has the ability where you can go into view and you can change the page style to be like these larger grids. And that, those are all very efficient ways uh, that you can go ahead and, and easily uh, create some brainstorming paths. Uh, one thing I did, though, is I want to take it a little further is I wanted then to take my goals from that particular brainstorming session and then try to maximize how I might do it in a quarterly method. So those that may use my planner don't use my planner. I look at the quarter um, and I say, OK, I have this vision for the year. How can I take that brainstorming session and put it down into essentially uh, a quarterly plan? Uh, again, I take my uh, quarter here and I break it down into my thought banks. I always think important part of any brainstorming session or any goal planning session is to have some type of solid motivation. Uh, but one thing I'm really excited, and you guys can learn more about this if you choose to, is then I take those um, that vision, those ideas, and put them into a timeline that I can work on for 12 weeks at a time. And there's 13 weeks in a quarter. Uh, but I always feel that for 12 weeks, you put a lot of effort in your forward focus and your routine, and it allows you to have a space of a week every quarter to kind of reassess yourself and better understand um, what your priorities are and help you retool. Yeah. And, you know, what I love about that is you highlighted the advantage of working in OneNote, even if you're doing handwriting, um, as opposed to, you know, using, I've done those too in meetings and stuff where you have like the big sheet of paper up front, um, or even, you know, with my myself writing on paper, if you can write it in OneNote, it's there for you available. And then you can kind of um, do things with it. Like once it's all out of your head, you can put it on a timeline or you can create a project or you can group things together or, uh, put it in order of the things you want to do first. Like it's like what you do, like the brainstorm is really great, but then you have to do something with it afterwards. And that's where I think doing your brainstorming in OneNote is really powerful. So I want to even take it a step further. You guys see I'm on a, an Apple I'm working on and Apple has AirPlay and uh, other um, Windows has its, uh, its own program with uh, some type of Castify or some type of broadcasting feature. But I've seen a lot of organizations do this where in their conference rooms or even in their office now, they have big screen TVs. No, it's not just for watching CNN and Fox News. You can literally take your OneNote uh, page or your application page, your screen, and you can broadcast it uh, to that TV in your office. And what's so powerful about that is I can be in a meeting. We can be having a brainstorming session. I can have that notebook up on the screen and we can be taking notes and drawing out no different than if we had a whiteboard on there. But what's so much cooler about it is I've seen so many times uh, that 10 years ago or even five years ago, we'd have meetings and we'd have these post-it on uh, post-its up on the wall and uh, these strategy sessions on OneNote. And then we'd be all getting on our phones and trying to take pictures of the post-it notes uh, and the whiteboard sessions that we just did. And here with OneNote, you can literally uh, have that brainstorming session and then if you need a new page, add a new page and you can actually build out your brainstorming session with your team. They have access to see it on a large screen TV as if it was a board. And then you have all the data right there. And more importantly, if you share that notebook, they easily have access to that data uh, if they're in the office with you or if they are working remotely. And to me, that is such a powerful tool. And the fact that it's free uh, is even cooler. I don't even know how to say it. Anytime something is, anything that is free and it works is cool. Yeah. And it, it works great. Um, and it's free as opposed to it doesn't work, just work great given that it's free. 
it it just it works great and it happens to be free if that makes sense um just to circle back to the concept of shared notebooks is there anything um you can add to the topic of brainstorming with respect to shared notebooks and especially if you're in different time zones like have you ever used that where you have people you know say this is the brainstorm page have at it or something like that yeah i kind of just touched on that a little bit in that last segment is mm -hmm. that you know if you are in a meeting environment or are in a brainstorm process being able to share that process uh, with that team uh, is really important. Also, too, is sometimes like when you have a call, and I have had many of these in my in my life where you have a really inspiring call and you get a lot of ideas going, you take a lot of notes. And then as you walk away from the call and you start to process that information, being able to build out that content. You know, maybe you had an idea where you said, you know what, we are going to, in quarter four, uh, we're going to launch a new website. Well, you have that conversation, but yet at the same time, you're thinking, well, I'm in the creative department. What is it going to look like? What are some of what are some of the creative elements that you need to make that website fly? The person on the accounting side might say, okay, if we're going to do a new website, you know, and we're going to have e-commerce, what's some of the bookkeeping items uh, that we're going to have? And every single person that's in that meeting might have a different view on what that project looks like. So being able to have that shared notebook and each person being able to continue to contribute to that notebook after the call, it allows them to kind of work out their theories and thoughts, their to-dos, um, some of the key things that they need to be successful with this. And as you are trying to draw those own lines in your own mind, you're able to see what your counterpart is doing at the same time. And that gives you the opportunity to say, you know what, I need to go ahead and connect with Joey from accounting because he's thinking about how this order is going to come through our system. And I'm wondering how are we going to promote this product and what channels are we going to sell it off of? I want to make sure that my sales efforts don't discount his accounting efforts. And in larger teams, that's so important sometimes to be able to connect offline uh, or connect directly uh, to help build out those ideas. And, and then if you're on different time zones, that's even, even more important because the being able to synchronize your work schedules is sometimes more challenging than that. Uh, yeah, that's a really good point. Cause I've done that same thing where you have a call with someone and you have all this great stuff. And then later, as you continue to move forward with the project or just keep thinking, you can look at other what other people are thinking as they're expanding on their brainstorming. And like you said, like someone from a different department might say, Oh, Hey, you know, um, you wanted to do this thing, but I need to know how that's going to work with the invoicing software or something like that. You know, that's, I, I love that. Um, so that was our only question. Um, so I, we have like two final points. So one is, um, so we're going to talk about, um, well, we kind of actually, you know, we kind of actually covered this. Like, what have you, what have you learned? Um, do you have any tips for people that, um, are not prepared to work remotely that want to prepare their business to work remotely. Like if you could go back to February before you had to work remotely and, you know, set a plan in place, what would you say to someone in that position? Well, I would ask them first, what is their current communications? You know, what are they currently doing in the office to communicate? Uh, are they having daily huddles? Are they having uh, weekly meetings? Do they hold conference calls? Are they all, is all the staff working in one location or is there some element of those that are working remotely already? And I would say to them is try to make it as simple as possible by introducing one new element. Um, so if you are doing daily huddles, continue doing the daily huddles uh, because I think what's cool about daily huddles is that you can really have uh, a really good interaction with your customers or with your um, with your associates uh, each and every day for a few minutes. And that's one thing that we did in the first few weeks of COVID-19 is every day at nine o'clock, we all got on a call together. We all got on a Zoom call together. We all looked at these client sheets together and we just basically kept ourselves uh, on pace. The other part of it too, is when you first start working remotely as a unit or you start doing more remote work is that because of the distractions that are taking place 
for each individual because they're not inside a work environment, you almost need to have that continuity of still meeting on a regular basis or having some type of touch point because it keeps traction on what you're doing. Uh, because I don't know about you, but for me, after going a couple weeks where uh, I only saw my wife every day and I love her very, very much, um, I needed other human interaction. And I kind of wanted to make sure that there was still optimism and progress taking place in the organizations that I'm a part of. So being able to have that daily touch point was important. So what I would tell someone, if you're first going about doing this, look at what you're currently doing and ask yourselves, if you were doing it uh, a media in person, what types of notes were you taking? What type of presentations were being made? Were they being, were they handouts? Were they on TV screens? How can you bring that content over to a shared notebook that everybody able is able to have uh, interaction with that um, outside the office? And then why I think that's important versus just doing like a Zoom call and sharing your screen with them is because when you leave the Zoom call, a lot of times they can't go back and grab the information and retain it. Um, because And they might for fail to write down the same information the way you presented it. So my first level of knowledge is basically introduce the notebook, introduce that content as part of what you're already doing. So that makes sense is that you want to take like the smallest step first, which is to kind of map what you're already doing into this new digital tool and then go from there. Um, okay, so I don't think we have any questions. So we have one more uh, point to touch on. So if you do have any questions or comments, you can get ready to start typing those. Um, where are you now? Like you're in the state of Wisconsin. Are you guys still working remotely? Are you going to continue to do so? You know, like where are you, you know, that's it. What's going on now? Um, you know, what I've learned through this whole process is everybody is kind of at a different level with it. Um, and I not to get too political or get too uh, down too far down a rabbit hole, uh, what the science is versus what the political side of things are. But I've learned that empathy is so important and understanding is such an important part of having a good relationship that just because I might feel differently about social distancing and where this virus is, it, you don't have necessarily the same views as me. But at the same time, we still have a lot of value proposition between our relationship to be able to move uh, each of our organizations forward. Or if we're cohabitators in the same office, being able to move our product and service, our business forward. So where I'm at is I've, I've told my staff, hey, if you wanna be uh, working in the office, you know, you're more than uh, free to. If you are going into the office, understand that you're also then exposing yourselves to the same elements that anybody else in the office is exposed to, but yet practice some additional uh, social distancing uh, policies. I mean, I always tell people even a year ago, if you're sick and you're coughing and you're not feeling well, stay home and work today or better yet, stay in bed and rest. Because at the end of the day, I don't want you to get my get the entire staff sick. Because at any point, it doesn't matter if we're going through a pandemic or we're just going through a seasonal flu or there's a GI bug running through the organization. Uh, if you're in a smaller organization and the entire organization or even a part of the organization uh, gets sick uh, with some type of illness, you're putting stress on the rest of the team to keep moving the ball forward. Um, so that's kind of what my thought is. My thought mm -hmm. is I've seen a lot of our staff has really embraced this. Uh, we've really done a good job with uh, redefining our week um, and being able to find productivity in it. And I'll just kind of touch on this. Um, if one thing that came out of this pandemic for me as I was doing my planning is I really wanted to, in the first few weeks of this pandemic, I felt myself like just like kind of running in circles and I didn't feel like I was getting a lot done. So I sat back and said, hey, you know what? I need to basically design an ideal week, uh, put down on paper, what it is that I want to do each and every day. Uh, if there's certain things during the day that I want to make a focus to, I want to make sure I find time to work out and still have physical fitness. So I developed the page that did that. And that's been really helpful for me. And I know a lot of our staff has done the same thing. And we've even taken the time to kind of integrate that piece. You know, there's a handful of us that are in the creative department that every morning at 7.30 are in a call. And those that are in the production, you know, they have an afternoon chat. Uh, about where things are at before the day runs out. So through this pandemic, 
communication is so vital and trying to find different ways to stay connected is probably most key. So I like that as a personal and a business takeaway about, you know, communication, empathy, connection, that kind of thing. Um, and then, so it sounds like from a business perspective, so your state's not currently like, you know, you're not mandated to work from home, but you've given people the option. Yeah. Um, okay. Wisconsin has the uh, has made the news uh, on their situation. We uh, we won't get into it too much. Yeah, but. we don't want to get into that, but you know, <laughs> just that in terms of like you know the law, you're not required to. And I think that's really cool that people can make that. You know, you've given them the option, like they have a choice. And and for some people, they might, and not necessarily even in your organization. I've heard it from, you know, there's been articles in the paper, and I've heard different people saying that they might continue. They love working from home, and it's like this whole new world. So some, we might see a lot more people just doing it permanently or some people doing like half half in the office, half at home. So, And I think um, that's what I think is really huge about that, too, is you look at people and how much commute time some people have. You know, there's people that are commuting into work an hour and they're commuting out of work an hour. So especially in the bigger cities, if they've been able to be productive and reduce the amount of commuting time they have, they're not only... Um, saving their own time and retrieving more of their own time. Uh, it's also giving them an opportunity to like, you know, just have more personal time for that matter. Because mm -hmm. a lot of us don't get paid to travel to and from work. So if we can reinvest that and help mentally clear our head and have other focuses, even if it's a hobby, uh, I think that's key. And I think what we're going to see too is that, you know, you look at the space that we occupy as humans. And if we don't need to have three spaces, uh, to be working in, and we can narrow that in space down to one, that's going to save a lot of resources and reduce the amount of toll that we put on our, our globe uh, annually by not having all of that um, traveling back and forth and those additional spaces that we need if we're working in the office as well. So I think there's a lot of businesses that are going to support uh, remote working. I think there's a lot of individuals that are going to thrive in it. There's some of us that are going to struggle with it. Um, no different than there's some students that just don't do well with virtual learning. And I think what's neat about this experience is we're having the opportunity to test that and develop ways to, to try to make it efficient. And I think when we come out of this, um, each organization will probably look at and look at their people and say, OK, for you, what are you most effective doing? Um yeah, that, you know, that's a really interesting point, too. One of the things we had talked about, you know, just about not using up space as much. And we had talked about um, the idea that for some people, they if they love working from home, it's it's like a it's a perk. It's like a really serious perk. And it's something that aside from some initial setup cost and maybe you, you might have to pay for an upgraded Internet connection or something, but there's almost no cost to the employer. But it's a massive benefit to the employee if they want that. And I think that's going to help employers be more attractive and to retain people. So, yeah, I think that's just a win-win for if for employees that want to do it. Absolutely. So, so we're going to wrap it up here. I just want to shout out to Sammy, who just jumped on the chat. He said, uh, you know, um, great effort. So thank you, Brandon, for being here. And uh, that he loves OneNote because of us. So That's awesome. Thank you, Sammy. Um, so... Yeah, if you have any co final questions or comments, we're just going to check the chat once more. Um, and um, we'll see. We'll see if any final questions or comments come in. So um, if you like today's chat, I would love it if you would subscribe to my channel and you'll get notified of future chat chat sessions. And they're, the schedule is going to vary a bit because I do have people from you know different time zones and stuff. And Brandon, I want to thank you so much for being here. Uh, we've been live for 58 minutes and you've been just, you know, filling that with really valuable content, um, both, you know, mostly on the shared notebooks, but also um, just sort of this idea, this perspective as a business owner and someone who mentors other business owners, kind of ideas that are related to that, like the, the communication and that kind of thing. So that I just feel like you were so awesome. So thank you so much for being here. And um, let's see. Well, I so, just wanna, Yeah, I just go ahead. Do you have any comments? Yeah, I just want to thank you for uh, inviting me. I mean, it's been a uh, been fun watching um, you know your channel grow as well as some of the content you put out I mean I think as you know every single year I feel that these different tools that we have really allow us to grow as individuals and you've done a really awesome job 
communicating to the community on what OneNote really has potentially because in the simplest matter, all it is is a blank piece of paper. And what's so cool about that is you can really make it your own and you can use it in so many different facets. It's, it's, an, it's truly a blank notebook. Uh, there's not a lot of limitations to it. And for a lot of organizations, that's a really powerful piece, uh, especially when you can take it anywhere and wherever you go. So I just want to thank you for having me today. If there's anybody that has questions for me or just wants to, you know, talk about entrepreneurship, talk about uh, remote uh, working, want to talk about, you know, trying to organize it and have some type of ideal structure in your life, more than welcome to answering those questions with anyone. Yeah, Brandon's information, so the link to his Keys to Success Planner, which you're looking at a sample page on your screen, and the link to his YouTube. Brandon also has a YouTube channel, which provides excellent content. Um, and I think people really like the style you do too, where you kind of show like live working in your notebook. So that's really a, you know, that, that both, those are both linked in the description. So you can definitely reach out to Brandon or myself. And we got a couple of a uh, wrap up. Uh, Paul Taylor says, Oh, good point, Paul. Um, the idea of shared notebooks and working remotely, it doesn't limit the size of any office. So that's a really good point. And it also doesn't limit you. If you can really do it well, it doesn't limit you to a geographic region. Like you could, you know, people from all over the place could work together. Yeah. And I, and I, we talked about this slightly when we, uh, a week or so ago, and I hope my staff isn't to watch at the moment, but one of the ideas that, you know, as we've been growing over the last few years, we've been talking about adding on to our space to have more production uh, space right now, half of our building is occupied with offices. Well, if my staff is able to work efficiently at home and it's something that they welcome, without me having to make more investment in the organization, I could easily take some of that office space and convert it into production space. And at the end of the day, increase our bottom line. And I myself, and I hope any other a good entrepreneur would do that is if there's a stronger bottom line, there's more stability in the organization and more opportunities for your staff. So, I mean, I think that is one thing that is a positive that could come out of uh, being able to invest in remote uh, working. Yeah. So Maggie uh, gave us a round of applause. Thank you, Maggie. Um, so that's it. I think I'm just, let me just hop over to the watch page and that is it. I think we've gotten all of our questions and comments again. Thank you so much, Brandon. Thank you everyone for being here live and anyone watching on the replay. So if you need to get a hold of either one of us, links are in the description and have a great day. Bye-bye.